This is Suzanne Light back with another lesson on Revelation. We got through the first one. I think we covered three verses, which, hey, it's okay. We got time. We got time. We're going to do it right. I would encourage you, if you are happening up on this, to go back and watch lesson one. There's a whole playlist, an introduction, lesson one, and this is lesson two. We will be covering just what we can. I'd like to keep these to around 30 minutes so that they won't be too long for you to listen to. And also, you can listen to these in the car. I may eventually move the audio over to a podcast, which would help. But um, I encourage you to have your Bible. I will also be posting the scriptures on the screen. But I certainly encourage you to take notes on this so that you can fully understand what we're going over in one of the hardest chapters uh, or one of the hardest books in the whole Bible, the book of Revelation. We said in the last lesson that many people stay away from the book of Revelation because it is hard to understand. But the second scripture says, blessed is he who reads out loud and those who hear these words. So we're looking for God's blessings as we go through and study this. I want his blessings, don't you? <laughs> I'll take his blessings any time of day. Um, we finished up with verse 3. And I want to go back just uh, and read verse 3 over again. That's the one I just quoted. Blessed is he who reads. And one translation says out loud, which I like that. And those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And we talked about at any point in anyone's lives, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know at any time it could be near. Now, so much controversy has arisen. Oh my gosh, you can get so many different versions. And as I told you, I'm studying, I'm using different commentaries, and I am just writing down what I understand, what I believe God is speaking to me not saying that this is the right version of everything, but I have really studied and prayed over this. There's been four basic approaches to Revelation in the past. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to know that there's different approaches to how people feel about the book of Revelation. The first one is called the Preterist view, and I, I hope I'm saying that right. And that is the approach that believes that Revelation dealt only with the church back in John's day. Because the letter, we're going to later go over to the letters that were written to the church in Asia. Um, that Revelation doesn't predict anything. Um, that the book of Revelation was just for those churches. And that's the preterist view. The next view is what's called the historicist view. And this believes that Revelation is a sweeping, disordered panorama of all the church history. And in the end, the view, Revelation is full of symbols that describe now to them. The third is the poetic view. And this approach believes that Revelation is a book full of pictures and symbols intended to encourage and comfort persecuted Christians in John's days meaning that Revelation is a book of personal meaning. And then the fourth view is the view that we as the church now are looking at it, the futurist view. This approach believes that beginning with chapter four, Revelation deals with the end times. And that's the way I would think the churches that I've been associated with believe. Uh, the period directly preceding Jesus' return. In the futurist view, Revelation's a book that mainly describes the end times, and that's what I believe, and that's what most people believe. So which approach is correct? Could one approach be wrong and the other one? So there's some truth in every one of these approaches, actually. There's some truth in it. The book of Revelation did speak to John's day. It, it did. It, it speaks to church history, and it does have meaning for our personal life, all three of the first three that I mentioned. So while elements of the first three approaches, they have their place, we can't deny the place of the futurist view. We can know the book of Revelation speaks with clarity 
about the end times because of two central principles drawn from Revelation 1, 1 through 3. We believe that the book of Revelation must mean something, or it wouldn't be in the Bible if it didn't. This is a book that Jesus gave to show his servants something. It isn't a book of meaningless nonsense. There is nothing like that in the Bible. It has a promise of blessing and not of confusion. So lots of times when people are confused about it, it could be because they're making it confusion because God is not the author of confusion. I understand there can be different views, but not to the sort that is just mass chaos confusion. Secondly, we believe that Revelation definitely claims to have predictive prophecy, what I was speaking about before. John made it clear, things which must shortly take place, the time is near. G John wrote about events that were still future to him, so that was definitely predictive prophecy. So that's the way that we are taking it and believing it. Okay, let's pick up with verse four from the first chapter of Revelation. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn, from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, let's talk about to the seven churches which are in Asia. These were real, true churches that John was writing to at this time. Uh, this was the Roman province of Asia, which is the western part of modern day Turkey. These letters to these seven churches were addressed so that they could be read processed and then passed on in a systematic way following the main roman road clockwise around the province of asia now called turkey so they started here and went clockwise all the way around the province of asia till every church had read the letters okay so that's the way it was done jesus told john to write to these seven churches that knew and trusted him and had read his earlier letters that came from John 1 through 3. Then he goes on to say, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who are these letters from? John is saying, from him who is and who is to come. And that's a greeting from God the Father who is described with this title. Him who is and who is to come speaks to the eternal nature of God. It has the idea of a timeless being and is connected with the name Yahweh found in the Old Testament. So, John actually put a greeting on there from God. It's never enough to say that God is. Of course, that's one of my favorite songs that I've ever sung. Or to say that he was or just to say that he is to come. He is all of that. He is the Lord over eternity. He rules the past, the present, and the future. And that's the way that John described him there in that letter. And he says there, uh, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, who is that? John brought a greeting from God the Holy Spirit who is described with a title, the seven spirits who are before his throne speaks to the perfection and completion of the Holy Spirit. John used an Old Testament description of the Holy Spirit. The idea of the seven spirits quotes from the Old Testament from Isaiah 11 2, describes seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It isn't that there are seven different spirits of God. Rather, the spirit of the Lord has these characteristics and he has them in all fullness and perfection. Now, would you know that without looking that up? Of course not. He just says, 
Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That is seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome to know that? So he's listing all the wonderful characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. So that is wonderful. Let's read verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So, all right. So he has given a greeting from God, from the Holy Spirit. And now he's speaking uh, a greeting from Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the faithful witness. He calls him there the faithful witness. And this speaks to Jesus' utter reliability and faithfulness to his father and to his people even unto death. He was faithful to us even unto death. The ancient Greek word translated witness is also the word martyr. And we know that Jesus was martyred for us. So he's greeted in these letters to the churches from the Father, God, from the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus. He then called him the firstborn from the dead. So what does that mean? The firstborn from the dead. It means so much more than that Jesus was just a person resurrected, okay? Others had been risen from the dead. People with whom the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles, they brought people back from the dead back during their ministry. But later, those people died again, even if they were raised from the dead because they were human. Jesus was the first one who rose from the dead in an imperishable body. Praise the Lord. That's what he's talking about there. The firstborn from the dead, never to die again. He is the first to rise from the dead. And then he goes on in verse 5 and says, The ruler of the kings of the earth. Before the book of Revelation is over, before we finish it, we're going to see that Jesus will take dominion over every earthly king. At the present time, Jesus rules a kingdom. But it's not a kingdom that's yet of this world. He's, he's the ruler over his kingdom. But we're going to see before Revelation is over that he actually takes dominion over every earthly king. So in this greetum, with its systematic mention of each person of the Trinity, it simply weaves the truth of the Trinity that there is one God in three persons throughout the fabric of the New Testament. So we know that, and he greeted the churches in such a manner to make that definitely known, that we have one God in three persons. Do you love how I'm breaking this down? Do you see why it's going to take so long? Tell me below, just be honest, whether you like this breaking down each section. I love it. It's the way I'm going to teach it. So if you don't like it, mm, <laughs> I just, you know, I would have never known what he was talking about from the seven spirits who, who are before his throne. That didn't mean anything to me because I had not studied that. And so by doing it this way, it breaks it down into a way that we know exactly what it's talking about. Okay, let's listen to the rest of first, uh, the rest of verse five and six. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him who loved us. What a beautiful title for Jesus. And that's who he's talking about here. When love is used in the past tense, he said he loved us. When it's used in the past tense, it's referring back to a particular place in time where Jesus loved us. And he's referring back to the time that he loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Loved us. Of course, he loves us. But he also loved us back when he gave his life. It looks back to the cross. And that's what John is referring to here. Every believer should be secure in God's love not based on their present circumstances, 
which may be difficult at this time, but based on the ultimate demonstration of love at the cross. This is worth praising Jesus about. Lord, I praise you that you loved me even before I was born, that you loved me so much that you gave your life, that I could have life, have it more abundantly, and have eternal life. Thank you for loving me way back then. Paul puts it like this in Romans 5, 8. I love this verse. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The work of Jesus on the cross for us is God's ultimate proof of his love for you. He may give additional proof, but he has no greater proof, no greater love than a man to lay down his life for us. No, it's not a wonder that a lot of people are not secure in knowing the love of Jesus towards them because they look at their present circumstances to measure his love. And we can't look at our present circumstances to measure his love. We have to look all the way back to the cross Settle the issue once or for all, and then give praise to Jesus who loved us. That is so important. There's times that we're living in times that are good, and then there's times that we're living in times that's not good. But Jesus is still Lord of our life. He loved us so much that he gave his life. And we can take great comfort in knowing that even in the darkest of time, that joy comes in the morning that there always is a light at the end of the darkness. It may not be the answer that we want. Sometimes things are settled in a way that we don't want, but God is in control of it all. It says he loved us and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what he did. He washed us, he cleansed us from the deep stain of sin so that we really are clean before him. This is worth praising Jesus about. <laughs> no wonder the same Apostle John also wrote in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it said not only did he wash us uh, from our sins, but he washed us in his own blood. For many, many, many years, there had been the sacrifices of animals and the blood had been shed for the uh, forgiveness of sins. But now, the greatest lamb of all, the lamb of God, sacrificed and gave us his blood. To wash us in his, his blood meant the ultimate sacrifice of God the Son. God wouldn't have done it this way if there had been another way, but he knew that it was imperative for it to be the ultimate sacrifices because other kind of sacrifices had been done. You see what an introduction that John is given to the churches to prove the love that God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost has for us. This is still just the introduction that he had. And then he goes on to verse six and says, and he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. What is he talking about here? You know, it would have been just enough for him to give his life and to wash us in his precious blood, but he goes on to say that he made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So we are kings, so we're God's royalty. I think that's probably one of the hardest things for us to accept, that we are royalty to God. But we are. He says it right here. We have privilege. We have status. And we have authority. That spiritual dream that I had, a, you know, that I talked about a few, if you haven't watched it, you need to go back. That's what God was saying to me before I started teaching Revelation. You have my authority to do so. Speak it from your mouth. You know, we may feel like we're nothing. We may feel like, ooh, I've done things that, mm, I'm not a king. I don't have status with Jesus. When you are washed in his blood and you are cleansed from your sin, that gives you a status, a status of royalty. Right here, John said it. He made us kings and priests. 
Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, We have privileged access to God's presence. So, we are priests. We are priests, so we are God's special servants. Servants that he wants to use in this earthly kingdom. Exactly what I'm doing today. Exactly what you can do in many different manners and aspects. We don't all do the same thing. But what an introduction that he gives there about Jesus and how special he is. And then he says at the end of that verse, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In light of all that Jesus has done for us, how can we not praise him? Lord, forgive me for not praising you enough. In light of everything that he's done for us, how can we not praise him? We should honor him with all glory and dominion forever. When we say this, we're not giving Jesus the glory and dominion for what he did. We are simply recognizing that he has it and that we're honoring him for it. To all, he has all glory and dominion and power over us. Praise the Lord. How beautiful is that? What does it mean to recognize the glory of Jesus? What, what does that mean? If we says, to him be the glory. How do you recognize the glory of Jesus? I told you I was going to break this down. You'll say, Suzanne, it's going to take us forever to get. It's okay. You're going to know this. You're going to know that you know that you know. But to recognize the glory of Jesus is to come all out and out for him. Give him everything, every part of your life. To recognize the dominion of Jesus is to let, truly let him rule over us. Let him guide us. Let him give us wisdom. Let us let him change us. If we say that he has glory and dominion, we're saying that he has the authority over us, body, soul, and spirit. And sometimes that's the very things that we have to give back to him and get back in right order when we get out of that order. So in summary of all of this that's been done, Jesus is portrayed as an all-powerful king, victorious in battle, glorious in peace. He's not just an humbled earthly teacher, which I think he represented well when he was on this earth, but he is the glorious God. When you read John's description of the vision, keep in mind that his words are just not good advice. They are truth from the King of Kings. Remember that. When you read John's description of this vision, keep in mind that his words are not just good advice. You can take it or leave it. That's the way advice is, right? Mm -mm, not going to happen here. It is the truth spoken from the King of Kings. Wow. That kind of puts a different meaning on it, doesn't it? Don't just read his words for their interesting and amazing portrayal of the future. Let the truth about Christ penetrate your life. Deepen your faith in him. Strengthen your commitment to follow him no matter the cost. Wow. That is quite a summary there that this that we're going over, it's just not good advice. As human beings, we're receptive to advice, and sometimes we're not. This is not even advice. This is the truth. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Let the truth about Christ penetrate, penetrate your life. Deepen your faith in him and strengthen your commitment to follow him no matter what the cost. Mm. Lord, let these words apply to our life. Lord, let your truth penetrate our bodies, our souls, our spirits, that we may walk in you as you would have us to walk. 
Thank you for everything that you are to us, everything that you're our Father, that you're our rock, that you're our Savior, that you're our promises, that you're our security, and that you loved us so much. God, you gave us your only begotten Son. And Jesus, you shed your precious blood and forgave us before we were ever born. Thank you for all of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know, slow go, but we're tearing these scriptures apart. I hope you're enjoying it. If you are, let me know down below. Make sure and like this video. If you watch it on your television, just go on your phone. Go to this video. Like it. Make sure and like this video so that it will get out and it will go and go and go. Because if we want to share this knowledge with everybody, we're going to be getting into a lot more deeper things to come. We're just in the introduction right now, but I want to make this in decent length of time of segments so that you can sit down and watch this and actually have time to do so. So my thought that I'm leaving with you today is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How great does it feel when you get out of the shower and you've washed your hair, you've shaved your legs, maybe guys, you've shaved your beard. I gotta for, I can't forget that I got guys watching this too. Guys don't shave their legs most of the time. But how great does it feel when you step out of that shower and you just feel like, oh, feel so clean. Well, that's the way that we can feel before God. Yeah, we're gonna mess up and we're gonna have to take a lot of showers and ask forgiveness for things. But he is always faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Until next time, I love y'all. I appreciate you more than you'll ever know. See you in the next lesson. Bye.